All right, well, great. Um, so this was actually supposed to be a slightly different talk. I was meant to give a, a session on, um, on uh, some of the, the more general stuff on building high performance applications in the cloud. But what I'm actually gonna be talking about is slightly different. I'm gonna be doing um, a few tips on how you get to be high performing, how your organization gets to be high performing. Now this is obviously quite different from um, building high performance applications, right? Um, but you know, bear with me and we'll, we'll get through it. So, this talk is subtitled, How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Deploy on Friday. Does anyone know why we don't deploy on Friday? Yeah, because it's the weekend. We don't want to spend the weekend fixing the thing we deployed on Friday. That's crazy, nobody does that. But you can, you can deploy on Friday. That's what I'm here to tell you. Say it with me, I can deploy on Friday. No, you don't have to do that. <laughs> All right, so quick, uh, quick plug for my sponsors. Uh, I work for Platform SH. We're a continuous deployment cloud hosting company. Uh, and if you'd like to talk to me about that, I'm available uh, out there tomorrow. Uh, that's the last you'll hear of it. Right, so what is high performance? This little guy here, uh, he's looking. He's looking for insight. So anywhere we've got something in this session which looks like a bit of an insight for you, I've just left my little man with the binoculars there. Um, these are the things that we have picked up uh, along the way about building high performance teams. But firstly, you know, what do I mean by high performance? What am I actually talking about? Can anybody tell me who this is? I think I've had one person ever work it out. No? You'll know his name. He's Bruce McLaren. Bruce McLaren is one of the most influential motor racing drivers in history. He was a car designer um, and a racing driver, uh, and you'll see, unfortunately, uh, he didn't live very long. One of the fates of uh, racing drivers in the 60s and 70s. But he founded a company that is well known for producing high performance vehicles, like this one here, the McLaren MPFPF, whatever the hell it is called. And also lent his name to this, the McLaren Racing Team, probably one of the most successful high performance racing teams in history. But even though these are amazing machines, even though they're powerful, even though they're brilliant, even though they're fun to watch and probably fun to drive, I don't know, I've never been able to drive one, these are all snowflakes. To start an F1 car basically requires hooking the damn thing up to an oil warmer. You can't just get in an F1 car and turn it on. It's got to be primed and ready to go, and if it turns off, you're in trouble, and you know, the engine can explode. They're crazy. They're crazy. They're super fast, but they are snowflakes. They are not what we mean by high performance. Let's look at a different kind of performance, the kind of performance that's actually really relevant to our industry. Different question for you. What is the best-selling car of all time? Easy one. Shout it out. Corolla. Very good. Yes, the best-selling car of all time is the Toyota Corolla. Surpasses even uh, marvels like the VW Beetle that was produced for much longer. Um, has sold, last count, over 40 million. Um, which is an astonishing number, really, when you think about it. There are motorcycles which have sold more. We're not going to get into that edge case. Anyway, the Toyota Corolla was created by this man, or it was created by the company under this man, IG Toyota. IG Toyota was the uh, ch uh, chairman of the Toyota Motor Corporation, which was originally not a company that you would expect to produce the greatest selling car of all time, because they made spinning looms. They're a spinning loom company who got into cars. And at the time at which the Toyota Corolla had launched, they had only made 2,500 vehicles. 2,500 vehicles. Now, for comparison, at the same period of time, Ford made 8,000 cars a day. So IG Toyota was sent famously by the US Army after, the, uh, after World War II to the Ford Motor Factory in the USA to look at practices and techniques which he could take back to Japan to build uh, a new industry there. Um, 
and he spent three months at Ford, and much to the annoyance of everyone at Ford, took everything he learned back to Japan and um, set about revolutionising Toyota. And one of the things he did was he came up with another man, a guy called uh, Taishi Ono, a thing called Kaizen. Kaizen, which means improvement, and is really a very nebulous idea, but is important because it is the basis of almost everything we do in software engineering and DevOps today. This one idea of Kaizen and improvement defines the way we approach our entire craft. Now at Toyota, there were various techniques that came out of this, ways in which um, in an assembly line production environment, people could uh, have influence over what they do and Im improve it. Um, but we see it in our environments in technologies, or sorry, not technologies, in techniques and practices like Agile. Um, Agile is based around the same kinds of ideas that Kaizen was. Improvement over innovation. Process over creativity. And these are really important concepts because, you know, a lot of the time your core business doesn't actually require innovation. Certain kinds of businesses are innovative or based on innovative ideas, but actually core business, business as usual, uh, really doesn't need to do this. Continuously innovating actually slows you down. So one of his techniques is called the five whys. One of the techniques in the Toyota way is called the five whys. So what is the five whys? Well, let's have a look at one. Why did the chicken cross the road? He crossed the road to get to the other side. We know that. Well, why did it want to get to the other side? Um, was it going to a pizza shop? Why was it going to a pizza shop? Seems like a strange thing for a chicken to be doing. Well, it was hungry. Most chickens get hungry. Uh, and they get hungry if you don't feed them. Why was it hungry? It had not been fed. Why had the chicken not been fed? Uh, because the schedule for feeding the chicken was written in a legacy application which stored the date as a 10-bit integer, and this rolled over on April 6, 2019. It's the GPS2 rollover date, in case you're wondering. All right. But we can apply this in a more sensible way to some of what we do, right? We can, we can look at... Um, why was the project late? And I only really put this up there to show you the kinds of things that Kaizen has led us to do, the kinds of practices that it's led us to. Perhaps more famously or more um, has had a greater influence is something like this, plan, do, check, adjust, which is a cycle that came out of that Toyota way and is used in pretty much any kind of agile development practice or you know whatever it is that you're doing and even... Um, uh, sometimes in other areas as well. What Kaizen is about, though, is elimination of waste. It's about eliminating effort, duplication, and errors. It's about creating ways in which the business can do this organically. And funnily enough, this is also what we try and do today. These are the processes that lead us towards commodification. So if we think about Toyota and the Camry, what is high performance? It's the ability to execute quickly, consistently, and in a sustained way over time. And it's having the systems in place that allow you to do that. Being able to execute fast once is not useful uh, in day-to-day -day business operation. All right, but we're here to talk about the cloud. You've come to hear about the best practices for the cloud. How do I get my APIs uh, up there? Well, it turns out it is actually very simple to come up with a metric that determines whether or not um, you as an organization are um, a high-performing organization or not, whether you're deploying web applications or APIs or any kind of system into the cloud. And that is that high performers deploy more frequently. That's it, one metric. The faster you can reliably deploy, the more likely you are to hit a whole number of other important goals as well. So unfortunately, my, uh, my slides are so tiny I can't even see them on here. Um, high performers generally 
deploy once a day or more. Now, I know that doesn't seem like a lot, right? We've been told, oh, you must deploy all the time. Amazon deploys, you know, 60 times every second. It's amazing. Um, you, you can do it too. Well, actually, you don't need to deploy that much. More than once a day is a high performer compared to some of the other metrics. Um, it's some of the other ones that are more interesting. So the lead time for a change, if you're a high performer, has to be less than an hour. You need to be able to get a change from go to woe in an hour. It's a bit harder, right? But if you can do that, your mean time to recovery is going to be shorter as well. And that's really important because even though you're going to try not to make mistakes, you will. And being able to recover from them fast is actually much more important than how long it took you to get there in the first place. We'll come back to that. Similarly, for high performers, your failure rate's a lot lower. The faster you go, the less mistakes you make. With one caveat, you have to be going fast in a sustainable way, not hurtling along hitting things, because you don't want to do that. High performers, in fact, recover 96 times faster than low performers. 96 times. That might be the difference between 96 minutes of downtime and one minute of downtime. So how do you get there? The question we all want to know, how do you get there? How do you actually reach the point where you can deploy on a Friday because your recovery time is only an hour? Well, there are kind of six areas you can focus on. There are six capabilities you need to have in order to do this. And we're going to go through them one by one. And I'm just going to give you a little, uh, a little snippet of each section. I'm not going to talk in detail about them because I think you probably mostly know what they are. Um, but we're going to talk about some key things that you can do in each one of these that will help you uh, move it forward. All right, so let's talk about a modern skill set. What are we talking about with a modern skill set? We're talking about making sure your applications are compatible with the cloud and that you have the skills to build them. Because not all tool sets are. Another way of putting this is how legacy are you? I'll do it my best radio announcer voice. How legacy are you? Well, there are a number of things that can cause you to be legacy. For example, you can be running unsupported things, right? Now, we're at a lucky point here. If you're running an unsupported application version or an unsupported runtime, it's probably not cloud ready. However, if you are running a supported version, it probably is cloud ready because we've gone through a bit of a change in the last few years where most things are in, in that state, which is great. Inappropriate data models are another. So the cloud is not good at rapid access to data. If you have bottlenecks in data structures, you will find yourself rapidly running out of resources. An elasticity of resources seems like a great thing, but if you need to consume a lot of resources, um, you're going to run into issues. Another problem is tightly coupled architectures, and indeed that's kind of why we're here, right? The whole purpose of APIs is fundamentally to find ways to decouple architectures in a, a, safe, um, a safe way. So that's great. Uh, the flip side of that is stateful applications on disk. So modern container environments don't like um, situations where state is stored on disk. Indeed, most containers don't have a concept of state beyond the initial state they're created in. So if you're working with any kind of container-based environment, and you will be because you're in the cloud, um, you don't want stateful applications on disk. The exception is file mounts, essentially, and, and data stores. Finally, having root access to everything is another thing that the cloud doesn't like. These days, you need to be able to do everything with the minimum of access rather than the maximum of access. So those are some of the pointers towards legacy, removing those things from your, uh, your, your tool set. But legacy behaviors even persist in new applications. Sometimes we write them in ourselves, but sometimes even we think, oh, we've, we'll choose something, uh, we'll choose some open source software or something that, uh, that says it's cloud ready. And you actually find that when you, you try and use it, you can't. So at Platform SH, we do a lot of stuff where we try and run um, various projects on our infrastructure for clients to make sure they work. And we found one recently, which not only did it want to install itself, it wanted to install and configure the web server, it wanted to install and configure the database, it wanted to do everything, it wanted complete control. It's not cloud ready. 
It didn't need to do those things, it was just doing them anyway. So these sorts of problems do crop up uh, and it's worth, um, it's worth testing them beforehand or looking to see what other people have said about them. In any case, you're going to be looking at the new stack, decoupled applications, APIs, client-side processing such as Jamstack and Stateless. I know of one very large multinational that at the moment is looking at dropping its vast array of CMS systems entirely for decoupled uh, Jamstack style applications, static site generators like Hugo or, um, or Grav uh, and APIs through to content services. Um, it's very exciting. It's a good time to be alive. All right. Development practices. This is where I get to harp on about how great Agile is. What's the purpose of development practices in this? Well, it doesn't really matter what you're using, but you need to achieve some fundamental outcomes. You need to give developers the freedom to make the changes that are required themselves. You need to put them in a position where they can make changes by stopping the production line. That's straight out of the Toyota playbook. There's a problem, stop the production line. Fix it. Keep moving. Some companies don't really allow that. They don't allow the production line to be stopped. That's not cloud ready. So here are the kinds of things that you need to look at. This stuff comes out of, by the way, the 2019 uh, State of DevOps survey by Puppet. There's a few facts and figures from that in here. Uh, very a useful um, thing to read if you're interested in this. Um, you need people to be able to make changes without approval. That's the stopping the production line, essentially. Sometimes that's making changes to the process. It doesn't mean they need to be able to deploy those changes, but they need to be able to make them, even if there is some kind of control over what goes live. You need to be uh, ensuring that people can reuse their deployment patterns, but more on that later. You need to be testing the infrastructure as part of the development. So we often say at Platform SH, your first push should be your infrastructure. Your first deploy should be your infrastructure. Because infrastructure is part of your application. It's not a separate thing. Um, being able to test your, in your infrastructure is part of the path to automation. You need to be able to do post-incident reviews, the five whys. You need build pipelines. You need to be able to make changes during business hours. Let me do a quick survey. Who here uh, does not allow changes during business hours? Anyone? Production deployment's always out of hours? Yeah, got a couple of wavy hands. Yeah. Yeah, so some, some people like to deploy, you know, let's do that deploy at midnight in case it breaks and nobody notices. Yeah, bad idea. It'll break. Guaranteed. Um, optimise your batch sizing. I'll talk about that again in isolation testing. I'll also talk about that again. <clears throat> Optimising your batch size. This is what Agile is for. Scrum, Lean, even Waterfall, really, is all about optimising your batch size. Batch sizing is about making changes as small as possible. Because the smaller the changes, the easier it is to test. Now, we often use techniques uh, that control our batch size um, and then completely destroy that by testing the whole lot in one go. Waste of time. Build it all together. It doesn't matter. Um, you need to make these changes as small as possible so that they're efficient, so that they're something that, that one development unit can work on, whether one development unit is one developer or a hundred developers. It needs to be sized correctly for them. Um, and they need to be tested and deployed in isolation. Uh, yep, said that already. Teams must be able to work on the entire life cycle of the task uh, and the application architecture must support small changes. So this is the reason for microservices, essentially. One of the great things about microservices is when you break things apart, it becomes much easier to test small changes on them. Uh, you reduce the number of places you need to test uh, and things just get easier for you. What gets harder is architecture. Why do we want to minimise batch size? Is anybody here in a, in a QA or a UAT or a test team? 
Anyone? One? I'm sorry, sir. <laughs> you have the hardest job in software. <laughs> Uh, no disrespect meant by this cartoon either. Um, QA, UAT teams, testing teams um, have it tough. They often get past uh, the most uh, heinously ambiguous sets of things to test and uh, when things break they have to go and tell everyone the bad news. But there is a way to make QA and testing much easier. And that's to prevent things from failing. No. Um, for things not to fail, they must be tested. For things to be tested properly, you have to test them on their own. So let's do a little bit of math. Uh, one change affecting one thing is one test. If you change one thing, you have to test it once. If you change two things, you have two tests. How many... How many... Sorry, if you change one thing... Let me start again. One change affecting one thing is, two, is one test. One change affecting two things is two tests. How many tests is two changes affecting one thing? Three tests. Two changes affecting one thing is three tests. A test for each change and a test for the two changes together. How many things is two changes affecting two things? Six tests. I think you can see where this is going. Ten changes affecting ten things. Who's good at math? Not me. Lots, lots of tests. Nobody ever does these tests, right? And that's kind of the problem. You never know, you can never do that much testing. You can never come up with that number. Uh, you do regression testing, but you don't get everything, and then something breaks. Well, uh oh. That's a problem. So, isolation testing is about ensuring that things are tested properly and that you have a limited number of things to look at. I've just been given five minutes and I'm only halfway through. So, great. Let's fly on. Um, isolation testing leads to a 5 to 15% faster UAT and sign-off rate. Minimum five times. Minimum five times faster. If you're currently spending a, a week in UAT, you're going to drop that down to under a day probably. Uh, it's, it's massive. In order to do that, however, you do need to do a number of other things. Um, you need to normalise and standardise everything. You need to make sure you've reduced complexity through standardisation. Uh, and there are a number of benefits of that um, for your business. However, it's a requirement for automation. You can't automate unless you're standardised and you can't get to commodification unless you can automate. So you need to standardise everything, your operating systems, your deployment patterns, your operations practices, your system cons configurations. Any snowflakes are going to break that automation cycle and slow you down. There are a number of ways you can go about that standardisation. There are a number of places you can get to there. The important thing is that there are certain metrics we, we know about standardisation that allow you to justify that. High performers... Um, uh, generally have these sorts of numbers around what they do. Um, high performers are 23 more times more likely to use deployment patterns, they're 44 times more likely to use testing patterns, and they're 27 times more likely to use configurations in a conf configuration management tool over, over standard teams. So they're pretty clear markers that those kinds of behaviours, deployment pattern reuse, testing pattern reuse, lead to high performance. They are things that allow you to deploy faster. The key thing here is to keep everything in version control. It seems like a bit of a no-brainer sometimes, but sometimes we don't. We don't keep everything in version control. Um, some of the things that get missed out are infrastructure configuration. So unless you've already started building your own infrastructure tool set, you may not be keeping that in version control. You might have that separate. All right, cloud native design patterns. We're going to fly through this one. Um, you want to use practices and tool sets which are built for the cloud. This is very similar to what we talked about earlier. Um, you are designing for these patterns. You are designing for services that use continuous integration, microservices, immutable containers. This is about stateful applications and making sure that they don't um, exist, essentially. Using APIs, I'm sure you're all going to do that since you're here. And designing anti-fragile systems. Ooh, exciting, anti-fragile, what does that mean? 
You want to design for cloud native even if you aren't using it, basically. Anti-fragile is a cool one. Uh, Anti-fragile systems are systems which benefit from chaos. You've got fragile systems, they break, don't want them. You've got um, strong systems, they don't break very often, good for them too. Anti-fragile systems are even better. When they break, they work even better. They assume failure will happen and they fail often. So you will have heard of some of these. But why, why are we interested in anti-fragile systems? Well, it's about the amount of time it takes us to recover when something breaks. In the old world, we used to measure the time between failures, mean time between failures. That was a, a good metric to know how, whether or not things were breaking. But actually what's more important is to know this number here. And that is the time to recovery. Time to recovery is far more important than mean time between failures. If your time to recovery is really long uh, and you have one failure, that could be a lot worse than if your time to recovery is really quick and you have lots of failures. Getting your time uh, to recovery down is, is the metric to measure and that's much more important. One way some companies do this is they use chaos animals. So chaos animals are a really cool way of breaking your application for you. They're an automated way of, uh, of really messing things up so you can see what's wrong with them. Um, you've probably heard of Chaos Monkey. Platform SH has one called UniKitty, um, which just deploys containers to our region and then routinely stuffs them up, um, which is lots of fun. So why are we doing all of this? Why are we talking about cloud native patterns and standardization and developers being able to c control things? Well, it's because we want to get to automation. Automation is, is not the holy grail of cloud development, but it's required for getting to these high deployment frequencies. And what we're trying to do here is get rid of waste. We're trying to get rid of waste in our process and we're trying to get to a thing called production-like environments so that our testing environments are identical to production because that is how we know that what we are deploying can be deployed on Friday. In order to do that, you're going to need to do continuous delivery, which is rolling your changes into production as they go. Change goes past. Change goes past, change goes past. Got to keep doing it all the time. Continuous delivery. Even if they break, it's important. But you need production-like environments or it won't work. Production-like environments are as exact as possible to your final target. Uh, and they're critical. Combined with isolation testing, uh, they give you everything you need uh, to run deployments with certainty. So what's in the continuous deployment stack? Um, source code, build, continuous integration, deployment automation, middleware configuration, environment configuration, and environment provisioning. Everything from go to woe. I push code, it's live. Continuous deployment. Customers who use continuous deployment speed up their deployment times by three to 15 times. Great. Useful. Helps you get closer to being able to deploy every minute. All right. Finally, commodification. Commodification is the last step. Why do we want commodification? Seems a bit weird, right? We've been doing all this stuff. We've been talking about automation. Everyone thinks automation is the holy grail of the cloud, but it's not. Commodification is where you want to be. Commodification is about enabling everyone who needs it to be able to get on-demand resources within your organization quickly and fast. Quickly and fast. Quickly and when they need it. Commodification is the final step that gives your developers control over what they're doing and allows them to deploy quickly and safely. But you can only get there if you can be sure that everything you're doing is safe and secure and reliable and deployable on a Friday. Commodification takes many forms. It can be self-service, you can build your own commodification architecture internally, or it can be something you bring in. It doesn't really matter. A lot of organizations do both. Um, what you're looking for is SaaS and PaaS kind of technologies. Um, you might launch your own internal PaaS or, or similar. But there is a crossover. So at which point should you commodify? Well, around 200 containers per engineer. If your engineers can't manage 200 containers on their own, that's, uh, that's something you should bring in externally. If they can run over 200 containers each, if your ratio of containers to engineers is over that, then you're doing pretty well and you're in about the right spot. This number goes up every year. 
This is the difference between uh, cost, basically, between doing it yourself or doing it somewhere else. So quick recap, because it's five o'clock. High performance is the ability to execute quickly, consistently, and in a sustained way. And we get this from the elimination of waste that comes out of Kaizen. I'm going to skip that completely. But that will deploy, allow you to deploy fast and deploy often and deploy on Friday. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up there.